Welcome back, everybody, to our continued look at the history of Turkey and the Ottoman Empire, uh, the Turkish century from Hittites to Ataturk. Uh, we are on to chapter five now. If you have not seen my three previous videos in which I covered chapters one and two, and then three and four, there's a link in the description that will take you back to that first video. A couple of things real quick before we dive into today. Uh, several of you have made some comments suggesting that we should be careful about the information we receive from this video series. Now, as I have said from the beginning, this is not an area of expertise for me. It's not an area where I am in a position to uh, verify the veracity of the things that are said. However, we have this incredible community of nearly 200,000 people on this channel, many of whom do have that kind of knowledge. And so I'm relying continually on our collective knowledge, uh, collective ability to research, to look into things, to point those things out. And so if there are specific things that can be pointed out that are absolutely wrong and aren't just matters of opinion, because that's a lot of history is about how we interpret things. And so we can have issues with how someone interprets something without it necessarily being wrong. If there are factual errors, things that we can absolutely say are false, please point those out to me and I will absolutely pin those comments, make note of those things, mention them in the next episode because we do want to make sure that we are verifying information and not putting out things that are false. That said, uh, the other question that people ask me a lot is how come you're only doing one chapter at a time? Uh, well, some of these chapters are a little longer than others. Yesterday's was kind of short. This one's, I think, 15 minutes long. So the video will be a decent length. Uh, we, after this video, will be more than halfway through this entire uh, series of videos in this uh, part of his story of uh, the history of Turkey. Uh, and in the meantime, I will be doing other things as well. So we'll do a couple of chapters, mix in some other things, come back, do some more. I also want to let you know that the overwhelming vote on Patreon for our next reaction series is going to be the 30 years war from extra history so that'll be coming when we've concluded this if you have other suggestions ideas recommendations let me know in the comment section below or over on patreon please consider becoming a patron uh, that is the best way that you can help support this channel since a lot of these videos i don't really make money on and it goes to the original content creator some i do uh, as well as my own content and it also helps support me being able to travel and make more original content so let's dive into part five When Tsar Peter I of Russia, also known as the Great, died in 1725, he left behind a last will and testament unlike any other Tsars before him. It was meant to be shown not just to his direct successor, but to be read by each and every single Tsar or Tsarina after him the moment they ascended to the throne. It wasn't something that he had left behind for them, but a simple instruction. Go and conquer Constantinople. Mm. The 1800s were a century of imperial expansion and nationalist separatism. Powerful states and ideas would equally come down on the Ottomans with intense pressure. And even though they would try to reform and revive their dying empire, they would find themselves unable to avert disaster. So really interesting visual there where you have Russia starting out where you don't even see them, but then they, they grow larger and larger and larger and they're looming as this big enemy behind the Ottoman Empire. We talked last episode about how Russia had kind of set itself up for that by declaring themselves to be the protectors of the Christian minority that existed within the Ottoman Empire. Well, now they're taking it a step further. So, you know, it makes sense. These are natural enemies. These are two large empires that share a long common border in areas where there's a lot of resources to be fought over. You have the Black Sea there. Uh, you know, you have differing religions, differing cultures, all these different things at play. So it just makes sense that Russia and the Ottomans would find themselves as natural rivals. The ideas which the French Revolution had spawned of men as equals, a people's right to self-determination, as well as nationalism, came to be the first thing to bite the Ottomans when the Greeks rebelled during their revolution of the 1820s. Foreign interests, however, also played a role in this. The Greeks were initially losing their revolution until foreign powers saw use in a weakened Ottoman Empire and sent their fleets to help the Greeks achieve victory. 
So we, you know, we talked yesterday about history doesn't necessarily always repeat, but as many of you mentioned, it does often rhyme. You know, even though there might not be exact similarities, there are often parallels that can be easily seen. And here's another example of that. You know, look at things like the American War for Independence. The Americans are only able to win independence because they get the foreign assistance of nations like France and Spain and uh, the Netherlands, for example, with uh, loans and things of that nature. Those were the vital components to that. And why are those countries willing to do that? Well, it's an opportunity to weaken a rival in, in the, the British Empire. Same thing here, an opportunity to jump in, help out. It's not necessarily that there's any great desire to help there be an independent Greece so much as it's an opportunity to see a rival that's already suffered in that disastrous naval defeat uh, where they lost any chance of controlling the Mediterranean. It's a chance to weaken the Ottoman Empire, and so those are opportunities they're always going to take advantage of. This was the tipping point. For the first time, a people under Ottoman rule had risen in revolt against its imperial overlords and won their independence. It showed to all the others what was possible. It showed the Europeans that they could expand their influence over the Ottoman Empire by supporting separatism. It showed the Arabs that their overlords were weaker than expected and beatable. Until this moment, the Ottomans might have even still had a chance to turn things around and possibly avoid a total collapse. But from this moment on, it became unavoidable. The Greek Revolution was one of the biggest, if not the biggest, nail in the Ottoman coffin. So I'm curious to learn a little more about the Greek Revolution. Let's take a look at some information. How many men were involved? How long did it last? How many people died as a result? Let's get a little more information on this. So this actually takes place pretty close in the aftermath of the Napoleonic Wars. So it's a very tumultuous time uh, in history. Uh, it's also a time when things are starting to ramp up as far as independence goes in South America. So that's kind of what's going on, on around the rest of the world. Uh, 1821 to 1829. So this is an eight year war for independence, it's similar in length to the American war for independence. Uh, there's the establishment of the first Hellenic Republic. Uh, there's a Russo-Turkish war that goes on during all of this time. Uh, and then the Kingdom of Greece is established in 1832. Uh, then there's an Egyptian-Ottoman war. So everybody's taking advantage of this to go after the Ottomans. Uh, and you can see here Greece supported by Serbian revolutionaries, Romanian revolutionaries, the Russian Empire, the Kingdom of France, the United Kingdom, and even diplomatic support from Haiti. So really interesting, about 150,000 total casualties. It's not really broken down by side, but that gives you a little bit of an understanding of what's going on. And I believe the Kingdom of Greece, uh, this is one of the kingdoms that gets established with uh, the Danish rulers on the throne. I don't know if that happens initially or not, or if that take uh, happens later on. Um, so the kingdom of Greece, the first king is Otto. Uh, so he's actually a Bavarian prince who ruled as king of Greece from the establishment of the monarchy in 1832 until he was deposed. So when he's deposed, deposed he's replaced by George I, who was king for 50 years until he was assassinated in 1913. Now, I do believe that he is a direct male line ancestor of Prince Charles, um, the future king uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, fairly certain. I want to say Prince Andrew is the son of King uh, George. Yeah, he's a grandson of Christian the Ninth of Denmark and the father of Prince Philip. So this guy, George the First, is the grandfather of Prince Philip, who just passed away, the Duke of Edinburgh. So interesting to see how that all ties together. It would form the basis of a new Greek national identity, form the basis of conflict and antagonism that would last to this very day. And from the first Greek day of independence onward, the Ottomans would huddle from one disaster into another. The first to take advantage were the French, who invaded Ottoman Algeria two years after Greek independence and made it a colonial province of the French Empire. Also two years after Greek independence, the Egyptians revolted, took Jerusalem and Damascus and gained great autonomy. The Ottomans had to get the British for help to regain control over the Levant, but the British would only do so in exchange for Cyprus. And within a few more generations, who controls all of that land? The British do. 
Both had to recognize Egyptian autonomy, marking the first time in centuries that an Arab nation asserted itself again on the world stage, with a ruler intent on modernizing and building a modern Arab monarchy. However, we don't know how that would have gone, as Britain took advantage of this fledgling little new state by occupying it and Egypt was thereby forced into another empire. Two years before the end of the Greek Revolution, the Ottomans, in an attempt to clamp down and gain more control over their European lands, cracked down on the Bektashi Muslims of Albania, which resulted in a decade of continuous Albanian uprisings. In 1931, Bosnian Muslim landlords rebelled against land reform. The uprising was brutally crushed, and in an attempt to solve the problem, the Ottomans split the lands up into new administrative sections, giving some of it to their Serbian vassals, which created new problems that themselves kept continuously creating new problems to this day. The and, you know, I mean, it was mentioned many times throughout the 19th century that the Balkans are the powder keg of Europe. And there you're setting up the future. And by, you know, the 1910s, you've got these Balkan wars that take place between the Ottoman Empire and their former vassals, and they can't even beat them at that point. That's how weak they are. The Serbs themselves kept having uprisings, and so did the Macedonians, the Montenegrins, the Bulgarians and the Greeks, who were still under Ottoman rule. All this turmoil and chaos convinced outsiders that this place was falling apart and up for grabs. It also fell into a time of greater Russian imperial ambitions under a growing nationalist pan-Slavic movement, a movement that dreamed of a greater Slavic empire, who referred to Istanbul not as Constantinople, but as Tsarengrad, a future <laughs> capital for such an empire proclaiming that the turmoil was proof that the Ottomans were mistreating their Christians and referring to the previously mentioned treaty that gave them the role as the guarantor of safety and protector of Christians in the Islamic world, the Russians invaded in 1854 during what became known as the Crimean War. And it seemed like the Ottomans were in for the next big disaster, possibly even the final one. However, the Russians may have been correct about the Ottomans falling apart, but they had gotten greedy. And with their invasion that was clearly aimed at Constantinople, they upset the European balance of powers. Those European nations may have hated each other, but they certainly didn't want a massive, overly powerful Russian empire dominating the Mediterranean and the Balkans. So in the end, the Russians accomplished something completely different, something that was almost impossible a year before, an alliance between the British, the French and the Austrians that forced the Russians out of the Balkans and for good measure also sank the Russian fleet. But the so it's interesting how this all plays out. You know, it's one thing we weaken the Ottomans. Okay, they're sufficiently weak now. What we don't want to have happen is in the absence of power, in that vacuum of power, that the Russians step in and take advantage of that weakness to become so strong that Western Europe can't take them on anymore. The whole, you know, from the Napoleonic Wars up through uh, almost the modern era, the uh, European politics and war will be defined by this idea of balance of power. And anytime there's a perceived imbalance or a potential for an imbalance, it's going to lead to conflict. Let's take a look at a little bit more of the information about the Crimean War. All right, so the Crimean War, 1853 to 1856, it's the Ottomans, along with the French, the British, the Sardinians, the Austrians in support uh, against uh, the Russians and Greek by extension. Uh, fighters as well under Otto the uh, First. You're looking at a smaller number uh, on the uh, Ottoman side, 673,000 against 889,000 on the Russian side. But look at the casualties. This is not something that gets talked about nearly enough. These are equal casualties to the American Civil War, but very, very one-sided. And you know the vast majority again died of disease, which up until World War II is the primary killer uh, of soldiers in any conflict. Uh, Five hundred thirty thousand, almost all of whom died of disease. Uh, not a lot killed in action, but uh, disastrous, disastrous for the Russians uh, in that attempt to kind of grow ever larger and, and achieve that mandate given to them by Peter the Great to take Constantinople. The resulting peace agreement exposed how the Ottomans' supposed allies and saviors were in reality just there to snatch bits and pieces for themselves. The British got even more concessions over Cyprus. The French gained the title of protector of Christianity in the Ottoman lands. And they would in the future themselves use it just like the Russians as a crowbar to justify wars. And the Ottomans had to give up even more control over Serbia and Romania. 
By this time, it would take drastic measures to save the empire, which the Ottomans conducted in 1856 by abolishing the Islamic Sharia-based social order, inviting foreigners to help build a new army, restructured the state to have equal direct representation for all ethnic groups, and even built a nice modern palace in European style as they adopted European dress codes. Now, I will give the Ottoman Empire a great deal of credit here because there have been many other times in history when empires and uh, kingdoms faced similar decline and just completely ignored it. You know, a perfect example that I think of uh, is not really the end of an empire, but uh, it is an end of an empire, it's a change. Uh, before the Ru Russian Revolution, look at Tsar Nicholas II and his absolute unwillingness to do anything more than token measures to try and pacify the growing you know, unrest in his nation. Uh, Louis the Sixteenth, the same kind of thing, did very little to stop things. Here, they're at least making major reforms in an attempt to slow down the inevitable. But these changes were mainly cosmetic and didn't have much impact on changing the overall situation, as things continued mostly as usual. Next. So, I mean, he says they're mostly cosmetic, but making changes to how your government runs, making significant changes to uh, the culture, uh, th they are cosmetic. They do appear a certain way, but they do at least seem on the surface, and maybe I'm wrong about this, to be attempts to reform. Next came a rebellion of Serbs and Herzegovina who had risen up against Bosnian Muslim landlords. The 1860s brought a Greek insurrection in Crete and an uprising of Arabs in Lebanon, and this was followed by the next great disaster. In 1876, the Bulgarians rose up in revolt. Probably sick and tired of it all, the Ottomans made a monumentally stupid and horrible decision. Instead of just putting down the insurrections as they had done so many times before, they sent an army that raped, burnt, robbed, pillaged, slaughtered and massacred its way through Bulgaria. In an attempt to pacify the place by terrorizing its people, tens of thousands of civilians were slaughtered. What this war is most remembered for are the mass beheadings. Every time an Ottoman army would march into a town, city or village, all men aged 14 to 50 were gathered together in the town square and beheaded mm. as the town was forced to watch. However, by 1876, newspapers were in wide circulation and had become part of everyone's daily life. Most nations had by then agreed to basic sets of rules of war that forbade the intentional slaughter of civilians. French, British, German, Italians, Russian, South American and American journalists were all over Bulgaria, witnessing and writing about these atrocities. So yeah, I mean, at first you could look at that and say, well, you know, what, how's that any different than how things have been done for millennia throughout the world? But he's right. This is 1876. This is a point in history where uh, you're starting to get things like Geneva Conventions and you're starting to have people kind of look at warfare as a more civilized type of thing, if it could ever be such. Uh, and the international community is going to come down hard on something like this. Uh, and rather than solve your problem, you're only giving yourself new ones. From one end of the world to the other, the news of what the Ottomans were doing spread, and the world united in disgust and condemnation of the Ottomans. Seeing all this, the Russians invaded. And this time, nobody was going to help the Ottomans. This yeah, so <laughs> give Russia credit here. They're reading the room, right? They're like, right, everybody's mad at the Ottomans right now. The world is disgusted by what they've done. We'll look like heroes if we ride into the rescue and, and save these people from any further oppression at the hands of the Ottomans. War, the 11th Russo-Turkish War, was an even bigger disaster for the Ottomans than the independence of Greece and all its previous military defeats. In the previous years, the Ottomans had tried to modernize their army, British and American rifles, German artillery, and British ironclad ships. But the Ottomans had not trained their army on how to use modern equipment and still relied on 200-year-old outdated defensive military tactics. They just Oops. hunkered down in trenches, hoping the Russians would do suicidal 17th century bayonet charges. Instead, the Russians shelled them into oblivion with modern artillery. The invading Russian army was also welcomed as liberators by the Bulgarians, Romanians, Armenians and Serbs. 
The British and French only intervened and stopped the Russians when they were only a few miles away from Istanbul. You shall not pass. If you haven't already seen uh, some of my series talking about World War I, uh, that famous line from Gandalf in Lord of the Rings actually was probably inspired when J.R.R. Tolkien, who was the writer of Lord of the Rings, was in World War I and very near to where he was fighting, uh, there's this battle going on and uh, the, the statement by the French was Il ne passeront pas, which is uh, they shall not pass. Uh, so kind of a cool uh, homage to that. In the resulting peace treaty, the Russians annexed the last remaining Ottoman lands in the northern Caucasus and East Armenia. Romania declared full independence and became a Russian ally. Montenegro declared independence. Serbia doubled in size, declared full independence and became a Russian ally. Bulgaria officially became an autonomous state in the Ottoman Empire, but unofficially was independent and allied with Russia. And we talk all the time about how history is all connected. Look at what just happened and how this is setting the seeds for World War I. Serbia grows in size, they've got independence, they're now a Russian ally. It's that alliance that will directly lead to World War I. And all of this is connected in that way. A mass exodus of Muslims fled these new states in what became one of the world's first recorded refugee crises. In total, 1.5 million who swamped the cities of the empire in slums and squalor. The modernized Ottoman Balkan army had been wiped out. The Ottoman buffer between it and Russia was gone. In any future war, the Russians could now just march right up to Istanbul. And it has also started something else. The Armenians had welcomed the invading Russians in Eastern Armenia as liberators. And Western Armenia was still in the Ottoman Empire. The Russians now declared themselves to be the protectors of the Armenians in that empire. The Ottomans now looked with ever deepening suspicions on them. Something started happening that would a few decades down the road lead to one of the worst crimes of the century. However, the end of that war gave the Ottomans also a brief respite. And it came I gotta stop here and say something too because I very often get comments from people, usually people in Turkey. In Turkey, we love you. I know there are a lot of uh, Turkish fans of this channel. I'm glad you're here. Please continue to be here. Uh, we're glad you're a part of this channel. I do not have a lot of patience for people who regurgitate the propaganda that they've been told that there was no Armenian genocide. There was. There absolutely was. Now we can debate just how bad it was and what the causes were and all of those sorts of things, but there is no room for debate about whether or not there was a mass genocide of Armenian people. It happened, period. Came through another series of events that started during that war, something unexpected that must have seemed almost comedic at the time. During the war when the Serbs marched south and doubled their land in size, they invaded Greece. The Austrians threatened them into getting out of Greece, but the Serbs started something else with that. The Ottomans still controlled vast patches of Balkan lands, but in these lands, intoxicated by nationalist delusions of grandeur and even race, Serb, Greek, Bulgarian and Albanian nationalists started killing each other before the Ottomans were even gone, mm. so they could have more for themselves once those Ottomans were actually gone. So it's not enough to have independence, but now these these different groups are saying once we can, they're all assuming okay the ottomans are going to be gone the ottomans are done we don't have to worry about them anymore now they're thinking about picking up all the scraps for themselves what can i get how can we make greece bigger than serbia how can we make bulgaria bigger than greece you know they're they're starting to fight over all this stuff for centuries, these people had lived together in peace and harmony, but with the idea of separation also came the need for new ideas, justifications and fictions around which to unite a new nation around. In that climate, what separated people became more important than what they had in common. And what differentiated people often was arbitrary. Bosnians are not Turks, but Slavs who converted to Islam centuries ago. So are they Serbs of different faith, as some Serb nationalists claim? Or are they foreign invaders, as other Serb nationalists claim? Or something else entirely? Are Slavs that migrated to Northern Macedonia Greeks? Are Orthodox Bulgarians Greeks? Who gets what cultural heritage? Mm. Should all Slavs be in one state? Should Greece have what it claims to have had a thousand years ago? 
As the Ottoman Empire collapsed in the Balkans, the newly emergent entities started engaging each other in hostility. Serbs against Greeks, against Bulgarians and vice versa, over who the people in the remaining lands were and should be part of. Fer the powder keg of Europe. You can see why this was such a problem. 30 years before the Ottomans had even left those lands. These fights were the forerunners of wars soon to come, but also the harbinger of greater catastrophes to befall the Balkans in the closing years of the 20th century. During the war with Russia, the other European powers met at the conference in Berlin where they divided Africa up amongst themselves. But also, How nice that they decided who gets Africa. I mean, listen, I get it. And, and some of you have commented and said, hey, you don't need to apologize for these people. This is the, the way of the world, right? The, the survival of the fittest, the, the strong take the weak. It's the way it's always been. It's true. It is. Uh, and that doesn't mean we have to like it. And it doesn't mean we can't say, in hindsight, boy, this wasn't such a good thing that happened. Um, you can understand it. And I get it. You know, that's what was happening in the world at this time. It's a time of imperialism. Everybody's looking for what they can grab. Uh, and Africa is the next big thing for everybody to grab. So secretly divided up the remaining Ottoman lands in Africa without even telling them. The British made Cyprus a full protectorate and occupied Egypt, which was technically still an Ottoman protectorate. The French invaded Tunisia and made it part of their empire. The Ottomans were furious, but there was little to nothing they could do. Within a time period of only 70 years, the once mightiest empire of the hemisphere had shrunken down to a fifth of its wow. former size. A quarter years. of its population was still Christian, but it had lost almost all it had in Europe besides northern Macedonia, northern Greece, Rumelia, and Crete. All its African vassals were gone, with the exception of Libya, which was basically just a scrap of sand and not worth that much. The Caucasus had slipped away into the hands of Russia, who were by now their biggest threat and right at their doorstep. The Mediterranean was now mostly under British control, and in the remaining Arab lands, the empire had lost much of its legitimacy as an Islamic spiritual leader, as the Arabs increasingly turned away to seek new leaders and solutions. In this mess, a group of idealistic young men would lash out in an attempt to save what was left, but in the end, would only bring upon themselves the end of the empire. Yep. And I think that's going to be the end of chapter five. It is. Yes, maybe. So that's the end of chapter five. And uh, I hope you guys have enjoyed this look at that. Please let me know your thoughts. What did you observe? What do you know that you can add to this? Or you can maybe correct or suggest other ways of looking at certain things. Uh, certainly welcome that. Use the comment section below. Make sure you check out the original content creator as well. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.